He loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Watch over his word to perform it. Thank you, Jesus. His word. His word. Sends news of his love. And he watches over us in such a manner that he is careful to protect us. It is in the Acts of the Apostles. Verse number, chapter 20. Verse number 28. It says, take heed therefore unto yourselves yes. and to all of the flock. Glory to God over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the flock, to feed the flock of God of which he hath purchased with his blood. For I know this, that after my departing, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, trying to separate you. And so God sends a man to watch over you in his stead. And so we honor God today for keeping his word for keeping this word. He loves us. And so I would that you would stand all over this building. As we honor God and his word by honoring his leader. He is the spokesman for the king of glory. Won't you welcome him today? Clap your hands for our leader as he comes. Come on, let's turn that praise up to God. Come on, give him great praise. Come on, he loves you. I said he loves you. He loves, he loves us, he, he loves, loves us, oh, he loves, he loves us, oh, he loves, he loves us, oh, he loves, he loves us, he loves us. of the Lord. What a wonderful God we serve. When God says he loves us, 
doesn't mean he feels just an emotion. Because remember, love is not just an emotion. But love is a commitment. Love is a sacrifice. And love is an act of obedience. For when God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. So with all that God has done for us, what are you going to do for him? When God opens up a gargantuan window in heaven and pours you out blessings that you won't have room enough to receive, how will you reciprocate to the God of heaven and earth that came all the way down, robed himself in flesh, tabernacled in this earthly body, that we could have access to eternal life. When God does so much for us, how much do we owe him? And so one of the things we can do for God is we can come together in worship. Because when the saints go up in worship, there's nothing the enemy can do. When there's a spirit of unity and harmony, the power of the Holy Ghost that is resident in you and I will stop the enemy in his tracks and the glory of the Lord will be revealed among us. But we've got to come in a spirit of unity and harmony because the enemy likes divisiveness. But we are a part of the body of Christ. And we are together, amen, in unity and harmony, fitly joined together and compacted where every joint supplies to another joint that what God has given us, we shall never be ashamed or confounded. I ask the choir to sing this song before I preach. I want every choir member that used to sing in the choir run up here when the saints go up in worship. That's when deliverance will come. Not when you cry, not when you pout, not when you point a finger at somebody else, but when the saints are unified, when the saints are on one accord, the enemy trembles because of the power of one, that there is unity in the body of Christ, and the enemy cannot stand when God begins to move with such great power and authority by his blood and by his name. Come on, church, put your hands together one more time and give God praise because the saints are going up in worship. When the saints go to worship, that's when the King of Kings will come in. When the saints go up in praise, that's when His Spirit shall inhabit this place. Strong and mighty 
the Lord in. Come on, give him praise. Give him glory. Give him honor. If he's welcome, let him know he's welcome. If he's welcome, you ought to show some signs. Come on, give the Lord praise. Give him praise. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works unto the children of men. Thank you, choir. You may return to your seats. In the word of the Lord, we shall extract scripture from the Old Testament book or the New Testament book of Mark, one of the four Gospels. And in Mark chapter number two, five verses in your hearing, verses one through five. Now this same account is given in the book of Luke as well. But today I choose to minister from the book of the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, beginning with verse number 1. Those of you that have your Bibles, please look around, see if your neighbor, meaning the one on the left or the right of you, has the word of God. If not, won't you be so kind as to share with them? that we can all read from God's holy writ. Again, Mark, chapter number two, beginning with verse one, and the word of the Lord reads thusly. And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway, many were gathered together insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. It was standing room only. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born or carried of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Today for a few moments, I want you to think upon the miracle of imagination, part two. The miracle of imagination, part two. For those of you who weren't here on last week, I preached the miracle of imagination. Take 
the limits off. Today I preach the miracle of imagination part two. Take the roof off. Dear kind and gracious Father, once again, we take this time to express unto you our deep and profound appreciation for the privilege and the unique opportunity that you've afforded unto us to call upon the matchless, the wonderful, the incomparable, the majestic, the magnanimous name of Jesus. For there is no other name that we know that can heal us from our soul's diseases, that can mend our brokenness and lift up our hang down head. Father, we thank you for the name of Jesus, for the righteous runneth into it, and we are saved. Father, I pray now that all flesh would be silent before you, that your glory can be revealed among us. Give now your servant clarity of speech, the ability to impart wisdom and knowledge and information, but most of all, divine revelation. God will give you praise, will give you glory. We'll give you honor because it belongs unto you. These blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Before you sit down, grab the person next to you and tell them, take the roof off. Take it off. Hallelujah. Mm. Hallelujah. Sounds like somebody already took the roof off. Hallelujah. Now before you go completely off, I want you to put on your thinking caps. Because even though this is a message that can be taken individually, more importantly, it is a message that has to be absorbed corporately. And so when we look at what is playing out here before us today, we have to then look at the book of John and the pericope, meaning the landscape before and after in order to properly assess and identify what is happening in these scriptures. The book of John begins to waste no time in establishing the fact that it will be dealing with the gospel of Jesus Christ who is identified as the Son of God and God himself. Remember, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, uh, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received back up into glory. This is the same God uh, that is now populating here in the book of St. John. But I found what makes the Gospel of John curious is that he is adamant about the fact that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. What else happens in this particular book is that there is no account, however, of the birth of Jesus. The book of Mark is part of what is called the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, because of their similarities, the word synoptic means having the ability uh, of formulating a general summary uh, of the things that are events that are alike or alike. Uh, even though Mark is listed, however, as the third of the four Gospels, uh, is believed to be the oldest of the Gospels. Uh, however, Mark's account of some events is missing. Uh, and therefore is com considered among many Bible theologians and scholars uh, to be the least of the four Gospels. Uh, so several things then are recorded in the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark that establishes the ministry of Jesus Christ. Uh, first, Jesus encounters a man called John the Baptist 
who was the forerunner of the first advent or coming of Jesus Christ, who began to go around in the wilderness, heralding the call of Christ, uh, uh, saying, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight his pathways. Uh, uh, many people thought that John was crazy because he wore a coat of camel's hair and a leather girdle as a man. And for John, uh, uh, that seemed a bit eccentric. Uh, but I just rose to tell the church today, John was not crazy. Uh, he was just different. Uh, look at the person next to you and tell them, I'm not crazy. I'm just a bit different. Uh, uh, my salvation and uh, what God is doing in my life does not make me a cookie cutter pattern of everybody else. Uh, there is something that God's getting ready to do in your life uh, that's going to blow your Holy Ghost mind. Somebody shout glory. Glory. So when we look at John, he didn't fit the traditional mold. Uh, he didn't do things like everybody else did. Uh, he wasn't trying just to fit in. Uh, but because of his peculiarity, uh, we find, brothers and sisters, that the Bible says that people uh, from all around Jerusalem and Judea, uh, even into the areas of Jordan, uh, they came to confess their sins unto to John uh, and to be baptized in the beautiful name of Jesus. Uh, so Jesus now comes on the scene at the very beginning uh, of his ministry and he himself uh, is also baptized by John the Baptist uh, and the Holy Spirit the Bible says descended upon Jesus uh, like as a dove. Uh, Jesus follow me now I'm setting up something. Jesus was then driven uh, into the wheel Wilderness. Uh, what happens when you check the scriptures? Uh, Jesus was driven. He was not led as some uh, a man purport to believe. Uh, uh, but Jesus was driven. He was pushed into uh, a lonely and obscure place. Uh, sometimes we have to recognize and understand. Uh, uh, it was not of our own accord or something that the devil did. Uh, but God is driving you away from everyone else uh, so that you can can have a unique and special experience uh, with the Lord for yourself. Uh, what it means is I cannot live vicariously uh, in my walk with God through somebody else's example. Uh, you see, I've got to know him for myself. Uh, I can't refer to grandma. I can't talk about uh, a man bishop's relationship with Christ. Uh, I must know him for myself. So sometimes uh, brothers and sisters, God will literally drive you uh, into an obscure place uh, in order that the only voice that you can hear is that of the Lord. Uh, and so now he's driven into the wilderness uh, and the Holy Ghost descends upon him uh, and there he moves from that calling uh, into the city of Galilee. Uh, as Jesus goes into the city of Galilee uh, he starts to walk by the sea of Galilee Galilee. Uh, and as he's walking by the Sea of Galilee, uh, he enlists his first disciples uh, to join him uh, in that group that would be called uh, the elect of God. Uh, and so now, after he calls uh, those that would surround him, uh, he now finds a man uh, that is unclean in his spirit. Uh, and Jesus cleanses the leper. Uh, and he begins to do all manner manner of miracles uh, as he matriculates through uh, his ministry life. Uh, Jesus now has a reputation, evangelist lining. Uh, he has a flair for the dramatics uh, because Jesus didn't just heal people, uh, but he told them, uh, uh, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Uh, he spit some spittle on the ground uh, and made a concoction uh, and the blind man's eyes were open uh, so Jesus just didn't heal folks uh, he could have opened his mouth elder uh, and spoke a word uh, but how many know Jesus uh, does things that are extraordinary uh, to get the attention of a people uh, he is known for his drama uh, because it wasn't just that he 
healed people, uh, but it was the way that he healed them. Uh, and so now Jesus is building a reputation. Uh, uh, some of us have built a reputation, uh, and we don't want that reputation to follow us. Uh, but isn't it glad to know that God can wash your past uh, and give you a brand new lease on life? Who am I talking to here today? Uh, some of us act like we came out of the wound speaking in tongues uh, and declaring we got the Holy Ghost. But if it wasn't for the grace uh, and the mercy of God, uh, there go I in the same condemnation. Uh, and so now Jesus, uh, he's building a reputation. Uh, let me say it like this. Jesus had a, a very vivid and creative imagination uh, for miracles to happen. Uh, yet one of the most compelling and inspirational accounts uh, of a miracle in the Bible is found now in our text. Uh, Mark chapter number 2 uh, and also recorded with a little bit more detail uh, in the book of Luke. Uh, when we look at it brothers and sisters I don't want you to miss this. Uh, uh, we may have shouted at the title but I want you to dig into the nucleus uh, of what God wants our hearts to receive today. Uh, uh, when you understand that uh, in this particular case Evangelist Wood uh, human will uh, participates with divine inspiration uh, in order to produce an amazing miracle. Uh, so now we have two ingredients uh, that produces a miracle. Uh, number one it is your will uh, and the divine inspiration of God uh, that causes you to get out of your place of lethargy uh, and move into a place of prominence and power. Uh, let me remind you that man, remember, is a tripartite being. Uh, he's made up of body, soul, and spirit. Uh, and in his soul uh, resides his mind uh, and his will. So now now, uh, when you look at man, he has what we call a free choice. Uh, no one's bending your arm to make you be saved. Uh, and no one's bending your arm to make you not to be saved. Uh, you have a choice. Uh, that's why God says, come unto me, all ye that labor uh, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Uh, take my yoke upon me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. Uh, and and you shall find rest for your souls. Uh, is there anybody in the house that needs some rest? Uh, I'm not talking about eight hours of Z's and eight hours of sleep. Uh, but I'm talking about working uh, in order to get rest. Uh, if you are working in the kingdom of God and working uh, for God himself. Uh, God will give you rest uh, that you've never experienced before. Uh, and so now God's dealing with uh, your imagination which houses your will, uh, which causes you to make decisions uh, that maybe you would not normally make. Uh, a decision that will hopefully produce uh, an expected outcome. I'm looking for God to do something uh, to expand my relationship with him. Uh, when I talk about your free will, uh, it is based upon whatever you have allowed uh, to impact your thought. Uh, look at your neighbor and ask him who you've been hanging with uh, because whoever you've been hanging with has the ability uh, to change your thought and your mentality uh, whoever you put a lot of stock in uh, can change your paradigm uh, I believe brothers and sisters I'm going to hang out with the eagles uh, rather than the chickens in the barnyard because uh, I've got some place to go uh, and I feel like soaring on the wings uh, of the gun that I serve is there anybody in the house uh, that feels like I do uh, that God has something great uh, and magnanimous to do in your life uh, and I'm not going to sit here on a lump of log uh, and do nothing when God uh, has imagined great things for me uh, so in order for me to get what God has imagined for me uh, I've got to participate uh, in the mind of God uh, that's why Paul writes in Philippians 2 and 5 uh, let this mind be in you uh, which was also in Christ Jesus uh, who not thought not, not robbery uh, to be equal with God I'm getting ready to do something uh, as
as I said, that's going to blow your Holy Ghost mind. Uh, in your mind, remember from last week, uh, is where you imagine. Uh, and as we learned last week, uh, to imagine is to enter into uh, the world of miracles. Uh, if you cannot expand your mind, uh, you cannot receive what God uh, has for you. Uh, when you look, brothers and sisters, at the power of thought, uh, it is so powerful uh, that in the book of Acts chapter 26 and verse number 2, uh, the apostle Paul, while standing in the court uh, of the magistrate uh, Festus, uh, who was from Caesarea, uh, Paul began to open his mouth and proclaim uh, a very bold declaration. Uh, Paul opened his mouth and said, I think or I imagine myself to be happy. In other words, Paul was managing his emotions for a command performance. For those of you that don't understand it in our Bible class, we've been dealing with the emotional Christ and how to command or take control of your emotions so you can stand up before men and stand up before potentates and presidents uh, and stand up before governments uh, and declare uh, that you've got everything under control. Uh, brothers and sisters, uh, I would ask myself the question, uh, what would make Paul uh, declare such a bold uh, and audacious statement, uh, especially given the fact uh, that when we go one chapter back uh, in the book of Acts, chapter 25 and verse number 7. Uh, the Bible says that many of the Jews evangelists uh, they came down uh, uh, from the various parts uh, and the Bible says they surrounded uh, a man Paul uh, and they got around him. Come here and let's do an example. Uh, and they got around him. Uh, come on Elder Flores. Uh, and as Paul was preaching and teaching uh, and bringing the word of God uh, and as he began to open up their understanding and the capacity uh, of their comprehension uh, the Bible says they began to accuse Paul uh, and telling them you ain't got no power uh, who do you think we are uh, we're the Pharisees and the Sadducees uh, we've got education and spiritual uh, relationship with God uh, and they began to accuse him uh, of things thank you brothers uh, that that the Bible says uh, that they could not prove. Uh, am I talking to somebody? Uh, when God begins to elevate you, uh, folks will try to find reasons uh, to discredit your elevation uh, and tell you uh, you ain't saying nothing but a bunch of gobbledygook uh, and try to discourage you uh, when God begins to elevate you uh, because you seek him early uh, that you may find him. Uh, folks will lie on you uh, and talk about you uh, and say you're not all that. Uh, but brothers and sisters in the midst of it, uh, Paul didn't say I think myself sad. He didn't say I think myself uh, mad. He didn't say I think myself uh, being mistreated uh, or I think myself why me? Uh, what have I done? Uh, I serve the Lord Lord, uh, he didn't think himself uh, a victim of circumstance, uh, but Paul was prepared uh, to move in the positive uh, instead of the negative. Uh, why do I say that? Uh, because Paul had already been forewarned uh, through the word of God uh, in the Beatitudes of Matthew chapter 5 uh, verses 11 and 12. Uh, he said, blessed are ye uh, when men shall revile you uh, and persecute you uh, and shall say all manner of evil against you. 
falsely uh, for my sake. Uh, then he says, I want you to be encouraged. Uh, rejoice. Uh, grab somebody by the hand and tell them rejoice uh, and be exceeding glad uh, for great is your reward uh, in heaven. Uh, so so profit it uh, or persecuted they the prophets uh, which came before you uh, instead of getting mad uh, when somebody's talking about you. Uh, grab three people and tell them get glad about it. Uh, you must be doing something right. Uh, lift up your voice uh, like a trumpet uh, and declare the goodness of the Lord uh, in the land of the living. Somebody open your mouth and shout glory. Put your hands together right now uh, and give God uh, an exaggerated praise. Uh, give God a crazy praise. Uh, give God a uh, supercalifragilistic, uh, espialidocious praise. Uh, and take the roof uh, off the house uh, and give God some praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. I feel in my spirit the word of God huh? in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 13 that tells us uh, there is no temptation that has taken you but such as is common, common to man uh, but God who is faithful uh, who will not suffer you to be tempted uh, above that you are able uh, but with the temptation uh, God will supply uh, a way of escape uh, that you may be able uh, to bear it uh, instead of looking around for those that criticize uh, look around for the escape hatch uh, look for the fire ladder uh, look for where God's getting ready to bring you out uh, can I get a few people uh, right now to tell the devil uh, I'm happy uh, because I'm blessed uh, I'm happy because I'm healed uh, I'm happy because I'm already delivered. I'm happy because I'm confident of this very thing. That he that has begun a good work in you shall perform it unto the day of Christ. I'm happy because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I'm happy because I recognize no weapon formed against me shall prosper and every Every tongue that rises against me uh, in judgment uh, I shall condemn uh, for this is the heritage uh, of the servants of the Lord uh, and my righteousness uh, is of God somebody shout glory Come on and put your hands together. Uh, we're getting ready to raise the roof. Uh, we're getting ready to tell the devil, uh, get out of here. Because uh, I've got power and I've got authority. Uh, and it's all in the name of Jesus. Uh, give your God some praise. Yeah, Lord, sit down for a moment. Brothers and sisters, let me encourage you with this fact of thought. The happiness that Paul was referring to was rooted in something that transcended his situation and condition. All of us have been met with struggles all of us have had trials. All of us have had attacks from the enemy. But how do you deal with it? Depends on how you think about it. If you think you're a victim, you'll go around crying the blues. Instead of crying out, my God, my God, I give you praise, glory, and honor. And so, brothers and sisters, I want you to understand, it's not what happens to you that determines your happiness uh, but rather it is your answer uh, to what happens to you uh, that determines your happiness. Uh, a lot of things happen uh, but how are you going to answer uh, what the devil accused you of? How 
how you're going to retort back uh, when the enemy comes in like a flood uh, and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt uh, that the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him uh, I say that because uh, I refer back into my mind uh, the writer of Proverbs chapter 15 uh, and verse number 23 uh, he says a man uh, hath joy uh, by the answer of his mouth uh, not by the circumstance uh, not by the situation uh, but how I answer uh, I choose to answer uh, I'm the head and not the tail uh, I choose to answer uh, I'm above and not beneath uh, I choose the answer uh, I'm blessed and not cursed uh, I choose the answer uh, God is my all and all uh, and I will bless him uh, at all times uh, his praise uh, shall continually be in my mouth uh, my soul uh, shall make her boast in the Lord uh, the humble shall hear thereof uh, and be glad uh, oh magnify uh, the Lord with me uh, and let Zion Pentecostal uh, Church of Christ uh, exalt him together uh, jump upon your feet uh, and give God the best praise uh, you've given him all week long uh, and let the church uh, of the living God uh, shout hallelujah A word spoken in due season, how good it is. Hallelujah. Tell somebody uh, it's going to be all right. Uh, don't tell them anything else. Uh, I don't know it. Uh, I can't see it. Uh, it's not visible right now. Uh, but tell them I imagine uh, your miracle. Uh, I imagine uh, your blessing. Uh, I imagine uh, your healing. Uh, I imagine uh, your deliverance. Uh, I imagine uh, a breakthrough. Uh, I imagine uh, a breakout. Uh, now give God some praise. Hallelujah. Sit down for a moment. Listen to me real good. I want you to understand today that your thinking is a reflection of your maturity. Your thinking is a reflection of your maturity. Our spiritual development is determined by how healthy and how well your thinking process is. Children, listen to me, children are distinguished from adults by their thinking. The Apostle Paul said we distinguish men from boys by the way that they think. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. Here it is, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. In other words, the way that I used to think, you took my ball and my bat. You didn't let me play. You did not give me the opportunity to say this. I'm dealing with a child's mind. But when I become a man, when I grow up in God and recognize my thinking process must change, then the Bible Bible says uh, I will be a responsible uh, child in the kingdom of God. Uh, touch three people and tell them grow up. Uh, grow up. Uh, stop acting like a child because uh, things didn't go your way. Uh, grow up. Look at the order. Children speak first. Is that right, Sister Dar? First lady, my wife. Children speak first. They understand later. And the last thing they do is think. We 
we can go over all of our children, Christopher, Carleen, Cameron, that they would speak first because a child does not have a mature thinking faculty. And sometimes you got to say, oh, grab the child. They didn't mean to say that. That's a child. As a grown-up, I shouldn't be running after you telling the person, oh, they didn't mean to say that. Yes, you did. What you mean is you didn't mean for it to come out that way at the time that it came out. That's why the Bible says keep the heart, the mind, where your soul houses your will and your ability to make choices. Keep the heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. You got an issue in you. You better get it to come out before God lets it come out. That's a process. Children speak first. But here's the way it's supposed to be. As grown-ups, we are supposed to think first. Then we are to understand secondly. Then we are to speak last. Remember what James 1 and 19 says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath or anger, being mature causes you to hear first, speak second, and then have the ability to manage your emotions for a command performance. There is no question that your imagination is fed by what you think. That's why the Apostle Paul writes in Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 8, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think, imagine on these things. It means you are not to think about the negative, but rather imagine the positive. You are not to think about the past, but rather imagine your future. You are not to think about what you don't have, but rather imagine what has been promised to you. For all the promises of God are yea, and a man in him. Brothers and sisters, we, we, we move now as I conclude to the text of our message today. And after performing a multiplicity of miracles, Jesus enters back into the city of Capernaum. Now the Bible says that he went into a house to preach. He went to preach the word. And because his fame had been spread throughout the region, throngs of people gathered in the house. So to the point that the Bible says there was no room from the front to the back, from the door, all the way around the house. It was jam-packed with people. When you look at Luke chapter 15, uh, uh, it is the uh, comparison to Mark chapter 2. Uh, Luke gives a more detailed account of the makeup of all the people that crowded into the house where Jesus was. Uh, and the Bible says there were the Pharisees of the religious sect. Uh, uh, there were doctors of law or lawyers. Uh, and the Bible said people from every town in Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. It appears to me that those brothers and sisters uh, that seemed to have more prominence uh, and their names had more weight uh, and they had more money in their pocket were the ones that were able to get in uh, and bring their loved ones in in order for Jesus to heal them. Uh, and the Bible says they all came uh, either to be healed or to see someone else healed. Uh, and the Bible tells us that four men uh, carried a man to Jesus who was sick of the palsy. Uh, now I want you to understand this. The names of these men uh, and the man that they brought in to see Jesus uh, were not identified by name. It is interesting to note that in most of Jesus' miracles, we are not given the names of the people. Could it be that Jesus only wanted to know their condition and their need and not their identity? Because sometimes we think it is our identity that gets us before kings and magistrates and especially Jesus. Jesus don't care a hill 
hill of beans. Uh, whether I come in and say my name uh, is Bishop C. Wayne Brantley uh, and I pastor the Church of Zion, Pentecostal Church of Christ. I can hear God saying that don't mean nothing to me. Uh, what is your condition? Uh, and what is your need? Uh, and what is your level of faith uh, that would bring you to me uh, in the hopes of getting uh, a relief from what you have? Uh, in fact, Jesus doesn't care because the Bible says your heavenly father uh, already knows what you have need of uh, even before you ask. Uh, but there's something about God wanting us to vocalize uh, and ask and it shall be given. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. God wants to see your initiative. And so God wants us to express it. Because we have not. Because we ask not. Therefore the question that Jesus asks most of the time. Is what will you have me to do? It was an expression of question. That Jesus asked all the time. Even though he already knew I believe that Jesus asked that question because some people don't really want a healing he said what do you need what do you want and I said that some folk prefer the pity instead of the healing other folks want somebody to always pat them on their back and tell them I understand what you're going through I'll be there somebody wants a handout and somebody wants a word that will soothe them because they get more out of the empathy and the sympathy than they do the actual healing and so God tells them what do you want me to do I don't need to know your name I don't need to know your background I don't need to know your history all I I want to know uh, is what do you want me to do uh, I'm asking the church uh, to open your mouth uh, and tell God what you want uh, don't tell me because uh, I'm limited uh, but tell the master uh, who's able to supply all of your needs uh, according to his riches uh, in glory uh, that's why I'm encouraged uh, by these four men uh, who got together uh, and said uh, our friend uh, has a need uh, and we're not worried about uh, our personal need but we're worried about uh, our friend uh, I have to ask the question uh, who are you hanging with uh, who do you have friends around you with uh, and what are they doing for you lately uh, and so the Bible says uh, uh, let me stop here. Uh, we that are strong uh, must bear the infirmities uh, of the weak. Uh, that means I have to look for somebody uh, that is less fortunate than I am uh, and begin to show them bows uh, of compassion and bows uh, of mercy. Uh, I'm talking to Zion today. Uh, I know it's a general message uh, uh, because last week uh, I preach uh, uh, take the limits off uh, that's a personal message uh, but today God is giving a corporate message uh, take the roof off uh, and so brothers and sisters uh, look at somebody and tell them uh, uh, it's not about you uh, it's about us uh, come on and tell them uh, I'm getting ready to close uh, it's not about you uh, but it's all about us uh, now tell somebody uh, in the form of a question uh, how may I serve you uh, how may I help you uh, what can I pray for you for uh, what can I give you uh, because it's all about us uh, and so brothers and sisters uh, there are a few things uh, that stick out in my mind uh, about this whole scenario uh, it was an ins 
insanely crazy idea in the first place to tear somebody else's roof off. I don't know if y'all got that, but somebody came in there because we have an evangelist and the church was packed and somebody got up on the roof with a jackhammer and started tearing a roof off. That would not set very well with me. And so it was a crazy act. Look at somebody if you want crazy results. You got to do some crazy things. Come on and give God some praise. Uh, these men uh, who were friends, uh, they saw the urgency uh, of the moment. Uh, even a few minutes longer uh, could have jeopardized their frenzy healing. Uh, number three, uh, the friends were bold in their resolve uh, to get their friend the help that he needed. Uh, even to the point uh, of interrupting uh, the sermon of God. Uh, they were willing to take the heat uh, for jumping or cutting uh, in front of everybody else. Uh, some folk been waiting hours. Uh, some folk had waited outside uh, like some of y'all did on Black Friday. Uh, got there Thursday. Uh, hung out in the cold because uh, you thought they had something uh, that you needed. Uh, some of these folks uh, were waiting a long time. Uh, they were all lined up. Uh, all lined up and all of a sudden uh, the friends of this man uh, with the palsy uh, they go get him uh, uh, there's neither male nor female uh, and all of a sudden uh, out of nowhere uh, here comes this man uh, drops right in front of them uh, and now he's first in line uh, you know how you would have acted uh, you would have been upset uh, you would have told him uh, go to the back of the line uh, but when God uh, is on your side uh, when God uh, makes you the head uh, and not the tail uh, when God uh, said you'll be the first uh, and not the last. Uh, put a stick in your back uh, and walk uh, into your miracle. Uh, walk uh, into your blessing. Uh, walk uh, into your deliverance. Uh, somebody shout glory. The four men didn't have anything to gain. They were doing it for their friend. Grab three people around you. Should be four of you. Everybody just grab. Touch somebody. Now I ask him, are you my friend? Because a friend will stick closer than a brother. And friendship is stronger sometimes than kinship. Come on, somebody. God says, I'll be a friend that will never leave you. So in my sickness, in my debilitating position, in my crippledness, my body and my mind, will you help me or will you leave me? Now tell the person you are with, we're getting ready to take the roof off. We're getting ready to take the limitations off. We're getting ready to get you into the presence of God. Come on and give him some praise. Come on and bless his name. Come on and take the roof off. Woo! Hallelujah. Sit down for a moment. I'm concluding. I'm concluding.
the Apostle Paul begins to summarize. He summarizes the attitude of these men when he writes in the book of Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 4. Paul says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Another interpretation is, as let every man look not on his own interest, but look on the interests or the needs of others. Brothers and sisters, in the text for today, the miracle of imagination didn't come from the man with the palsy, but rather it came from those who were around him. Everybody, one more time, look, 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 look who's around you. Sometime the people that you least expect are the ones that have your deliverance. You say because they don't dress like me. They don't act like me. So you sit around the same people every day and have not expanded your imagination. You have not expanded your friendship. Somebody may have had your rent right in their pocket. Somebody may have known how to get you past the red tape. But sometimes we stay with those we are most comfortable with. And because we're the most comfortable with them, we become satisfied sometimes with mediocrity. Not saying there's anything wrong with them. But look at your neighbor and tell him iron sharpens iron. If one of us is a stick, if one of us is a piece of wood, Somebody ain't going to get sharpened, but rather you're going to get cut. Last week we preached about the miracle of imagination. Today we're preaching about the miracle of imagination because of who we have surrounded ourselves with. Zion, hear me good. The people that you have surrounded yourself with, do they see obstacles or do they see opportunities? These men saw an opportunity, not an obstacle. They imagine a chance to participate in someone else's miracle. The Bible tells us these men were confronted with an impossible and impassable situation. There was literally, evangelists, no more room for a miracle. I need you to hear what I'm saying. This house was packed with people and there was no more space for grace. Some of you don't understand what I'm talking about. So let me bring it down to where the rubber meets the road. These men had a ministry assignment. But there appeared to be no more room in Zion. Oh, Zion I, I meant no more room in the house. No more room in the ministry. Can't get in the pulpit, it's packed. Won't let me on the usher board. Can't play in the band. So what do we do? We go home and we stay in the same condition we were in before. Instead of getting some prayer partners around you. Are you with me? And you surround yourself with people that will pray and break the stronghold. Uh, tear the roof off. Tear the limitations off. Tear the encumbrances off. And get what you need from the Lord. You with me? You connected to me? Remember what the Honorable Bishop Norman L. Wagner said. I, I've said it over, over time. And I, I, I quote him all the time. That imagination produces manifestation. If you can imagine. And then if you can imagine. Then it will produce a manifestation. And limitations. Everybody say it with me. Limitations must bow at the feet of imagination. Limitations must bow at the feet of imagination. 
It's not just any imagination, but it is the mind of God. When God gives you an imagination, there is no precedent. There's no template that has been made. So what God's getting ready to do with you has never been done before. You ought to give God some praise for that. It's never been done before. Now look at three people and say deconstruct. 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 Tear apart uh, the old paradigm. Tear apart the old mindset. Break it up. The people that are around you will help produce your miracle or produce your misery. God told me to tell Zion, we're going to have to break the roof off. What are you talking about? People are not going to come into Zion by traditional means. I'm not talking about compromising the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's get that right. But what I'm talking about is I still believe in one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. But what I'm speaking about, hear me, is creating new doors and new entranceways. So, buddy, what, what do you mean? I mean, God's going to bring somebody in because he's going to make the ceiling the door. He's still the door, but you're going to come through the ceiling. So what are you saying, Pastor? It's going to take work to break some paradigm. See, when we look at the roof, that they got up on the roof, and it wasn't some ancient uh, century thatch roof made of leaves and stuff. This was a roof made of mud similar to cement and clay tiles. And the Bible said they had to break through the roof. Here's the thing that is important, Zion, and don't miss it. When they had to break through the roof, they had to literally pound and hammer to make a hole in the roof. Now remember, debris was falling, chunks of cement, but the Bible never records that anybody was injured. What are you saying? When God opens new doors, we cannot injure the people that are already in the church. Yeah, God wants us to break some stuff up, but you cannot drop everything on everybody. Y'all hearing me? Well, I ain't telling you nothing but the truth. Well, tell the truth in love. That's Bible. And in love says when I tell it, I'm not going to drop a piece of towel on your head. So when God creates new openings, new doors, be careful you don't hurt and harm the innocent. Y'all hearing me? Y'all hearing me? Stop trying to skin the fish before God turns them into a sheep. And when they become lambs, stop trying to shear all the wool off of them. Give them a chance to mature. God is telling Zion, take the roof off. Not for ourselves, but for somebody else. Take off the preconceived notions. Take off prejudice and bias. Take off the commandments of men that we teach for doctrine. Take off the exclusive club mentality of just us and nobody else. Take it off. God said in the last days I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh indiscriminately. God's going to save people that you never thought would be saved. God's going to bring people into the house uh, that's going to come in. Don't look, don't smell, don't act like, don't talk like y'all. They will begin to smell different. I'm going to say something and I hope my grandson doesn't mind. I remember when I, it started happening to me. 
he runs into the family room. And when he gets into the family room, he runs over to me and he says, so I, I thought he meant give him a kiss, so I kissed him. He said, no, no, no. He said, smell me. I said, that smells good. Where'd you get it from? He said, I got it from your cologne collection. <laughs> what he was trying to tell me, I'm going to start, I'm starting to smell a little bit different. Yeah. I, I don't know if he got his eyes on some little filly in, in, in the school. <laughs> but remember when I was a child, I thought as a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child. But now when you grow up, Smells make a difference. Let me say this. You remember when the priests would get ready to go into the holies of holies. And the Bible says the priests would stay up all night preparing. And those who were around him would minister unto him scripture so that no vile thought could get into his mind. And so up all night, because when he had to go into the most holy place, he had to have no error thought in his mind. So they kept him all night preaching and teaching and rehearsing the scriptures to him. And the Bible says that he began to put together the censer that morning. And when he went under the tent, he didn't go through the door. He went under the skirts of the tent. And he began to shake the censer that had all of the galbanum, the frankincense, the incense. And all of the pure spices that, that, that were, were given by God. Amen. To minister. And so when he went in, he would shake it. And the sanctuary was filled with the smoke of God. The Bible says it was a sweet smelling savor that went up to the nostrils of God. And when the priest came out, it wasn't the robe that he had on. It wasn't what the garb that he was wearing. When he came out, they knew he had been with God by the way that he smelled. Now ask the person next to you, uh, how do I smell? Uh, do I smell like God? Uh, do I have the aroma of peace? Uh, do I have the aroma of love? Uh, do I have the aroma of forgiveness? Uh, how do I smell? You see, when people start coming to Zion, they'll be asking the question, what is that I smell? Because what you smell like is what God acts like. Then you'll wonder, why are people drawn to you? When people get around you, they'll be like my grandson, Brandon. They'll want to get a whiff of a God smell. Not a whiff of a Zion smell. Not a whiff of a Baptist smell. Not a whiff of a Methodist smell. But I smell God. Tell three people, take the roof off. How do I smell? Come on, ministers. God told me to ask the church. If there's any impediment, if there's any hindrance, God said, I'll remove it today. I'll remove it right now. You don't have to be encumbered with the things of your past. You don't be, have to be saddled with a mistake that you made. God will set you free. Because he who the Son sets free is free indeed. Come, come. If you've never had the privilege of being water baptized in the wonderful, the matchless name of Jesus, this is your opportunity. Get up out of your seats. Run down to this altar. As you ask the question, what must I do to be saved? The Bible says if you want to be saved and give your life to the Lord, be baptized in Jesus' name. Let the power of the Holy Spirit rest and rule in your life. And watch God make you brand new again. Come, come, come. God is speaking to your heart. God is speaking to you today. Open up, open up. Let God do something miraculous. 
because of the miracle of your imagination. That I can be everything that God dreamed for me to be before the foundation of the world. Come, come, come. If you need one of these ministers to covenant partner with you and to pray with you, get up from your seat now. Run down to this altar. Let God bless you real good. There's no shame. Amen. In prayer, we all need prayer. We need it every day, but sometimes we need two or more. Because the Bible says two are better than one because they have a good reward for the labor. If the one falls, his fellow shall lift him up and a threefold cord is not easily broken. When you have God and one of these partners, a covenant partner in prayer, and yourself, it's difficult for the enemy to come in and break up what God has solidified already in the spirit. Come, come, are there others? We're not going to hold this altar call long. As I said, a lot of this message is germane to Zion because of what God is getting ready to do. There's going to be an explosion of souls because it was promised in the last days that he would pour out his spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. That's a reversal because normally old men shall see visions and young men dream dreams. But old men are going to dream dreams and young men are going to see visions. So God's getting ready to make an across the board revelation to all who will bow humbly and submissive to the divine and perfect will of God. Get up, get up, get up. Come, come, come. Let God bless you real, real, real good. Let the congregation stand to your feet. We're getting ready to go before the Lord in prayer. Hallelujah. Get the thoughts of God. Get the mind of God. Remember, God speaks about it in the book of Isaiah 55. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts than your thoughts and my ways. Then your ways as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and watereth the earth and bringeth forth the bud and return not thither. He said, so that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And it will prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. That means God's word can never go out and return void or empty unto him. It will produce. If we can just imagine in the corridors of God's mind, the same kind of imagination brings the same kind of positive hope that God will do it because his word has said so. Grab your neighbor by the hand. We prepare to go before the Lord in prayer. Oh, hallelujah. Ella Flores, come, come, lead us before the throne in prayer today. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come. Glory to God. We thank you for privilege and opportunity that you've given unto us to approach your throne of grace. We thank you, God, for the word that you've sent for us. Prepare us for this next level that we're going to. I pray, God, in the name of Jesus Christ, that our minds will be set and our spirits, Lord, in line with the will of God. So, God, when the roof is torn off, we will be prepared, God, to save souls and to deliver them, God, in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank you for the word that you sent from heaven, Lord, the prophetic word that you've given to this house. Now, God, in the name of Jesus Christ, everyone that's come down for help, looking for a way out or a way in, God, fulfill the needs of your people in the name of Jesus. Jesus Christ. Now, God, in the name of Jesus, increase our faith in you. God, because this level that we're going is going to take great faith. Faith, God, that can move mountains. Faith in the name of Jesus Christ that would do whatever it takes, God, to reach God and to move heaven. So, God, is in the name of Jesus. Equip us, God, in God, in your blessed name. Prepare us for this next level. 
this next move of God. Lord, and we promise to give your name praise, glory, and honor. We promise not to let you down, but to stand, Lord, on your word and to not move. So God, right now, this hour, this moment, this second, transformation God we claim it done we claim our deliverance already now we thank you for what you've said and what you've already done for we know God that once you've spoken it up once you thought it up it's already in progress it's already happened so God we thank you Thank you for the way in, God. Thank you for your deliverance. And we thank you for you being God and God all by yourself. Now, God, we seal this word and this prayer so no devil can take it away from us. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.